Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Arne about overcoming imposter syndrome. Arnie Witkin, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah, and you are joining us from Cape Town. Uh, so it's evening for you, morning for me. Uh, you're joining us from the other side of the world. It's a pleasure to be with you. And you have such a rich life uh, and career of experience that I'm really excited to have an opportunity to chat with you and, and for you to be willing to share your insights and experience with me and my listeners. It's a real pleasure. Today, we're going to be focusing on overcoming imposter syndrome, both in our personal lives. You know, for me as an individual, I need to recognize it. I need to be able to overcome it. But as a leader, I also need to model that for people on my team and I need to support them and help them to do the same uh, so that we can all thrive and we can all be our, our best selves. As we get started, I wanted to share Arnie's bio with everybody. Arnie Witkin is a speech writer, public speaking coach, mentor, executive coach, and author of It's Not a Big Thing in Life, Strategies for Coping, Considerations for My Adult Grandchildren. A native of South Africa, Witkin was successful with three private equity companies and has spoken at major investment conferences. He has survived two different types of cancer since first being diagnosed in 2001, and he has been married for 47 years has two sons and six grandchildren. And congratulations on the longevity of your marriage. And also it's incredible that you, you've been able to uh, uh, deal with and, and beat the cancer on two occasions. And that's, I, I imagine an ongoing struggle um, in that it's tremendous bravery, I think has demonstrated through that. Uh, anything else, Arnie, that you would like to share with listeners by way of background or personal context before we dive on in? Um, no, John, I would like to say it's now, it's now 48 years, um, and it, I'm very fortunate to have had such a successful and loving marriage, um, which has been a tremendous help to me in my career, and of course, personal life, and uh, one, of the, one of the best decisions I ever made was to marry my wife. Amen. I, I feel the same way. I still have a long ways to go. I guess I'm never going to catch up really, um, seeing how I'm, I'm uh, about 30 years behind you. But um, I've been married for go, almost 20 years. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure. And I, I have a, a tremendous life partner as well. And yeah, family and, and the children, uh, and in your case, grandchildren, it's a wonderful, wonderful blessing, a wonderful thing. Well, Arnie, uh, why imposter syndrome? Why is this something you spend so much of your time and energy focusing on in your work? Well, what astonishes me is how many people actually suffer from this. Um, they say 70% of people suffer from it, but when you read names like Lady Kaga, Tom Hanks, Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook, um, Howard Schultz, from Starbucks, they say they suffer from imposter syndrome. What does it mean? It means that somewhere underneath it all, they think that they're not quite good enough for the job. But of course they are. So I've divided it into three levels of imposter syndrome. The one is people who function at an extremely high level, like the people I just mentioned. Sure, they feel they've got imposter syndrome, but they live with it. 
If I don't say, get over it, get on with it, they get on with life. The second level is everyday ordinary people like myself, probably like yourself. We have imposter syndrome. I've had imposter syndrome my entire life, but I function. Um, maybe not at that high level. And the third level is people often who work in companies where the imposter syndrome can be quite debilitating. And that needs a different level of communication, of understanding, of helping them get over this or get through it. Um, why do we have imposter syndrome? Does it come from childhood? I got 98% for a math test. My father said, what in the other 2%? So he said, okay, you know, not good enough. You've had a teacher who wasn't, who was aggressive, didn't understand it. Um, look, you can have a girlfriend who said to me, don't phone me again. You're immature, you're tied to your mother's apron strings, and you're not on the same intellectual level. Now, these sort of things can affect you. Depends how long they affect you for. So, yeah, it's one of the things I do, and, and people come, they say they've got imposter syndrome, and then I have to, I, I tell them how to possibly deal with it. Yeah. And like you say, it's super common. Um, we all tend to experience it at one point or another. And the, the reality is we all have our own insecurities um, and we all are trying to figure it out as we go. And so it's, it's only natural that we would feel that way. And the question is, you know, not whether we, we do feel that way from time to time, it, it's how we deal with it. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so recognizing that, sure, we may, we may not know exactly what we're doing. Um, I often say, you know, I'm, I'm building the plane while I'm flying it. I'm trying to figure it out as I go. Right. Um, and that's okay. And so learning to be okay with that is one way to deal with it. Um, another way is to just realize that, yeah, you know, I'm going to feel this way. And it, it's something that if I allow to become debilitating, so that I'm always scared of messing up or being found out, then I'm going to derail my own ability to be successful, you know, in my personal life with my, with my organization, with my, with my team. Yeah. Um, you, 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 I, you mentioned the, the analogy of the plane. I say, if you've got an imposter syndrome, the plane's probably much better than mine. I say, if you're the captain of a ship, and you're in a storm. You can't think, oh my God, am I good enough for this job? <laughs> You've got to get the ship out. You can't be worrying about whether you're good enough or not. But that applies, I think, with, with every job. Because you acknowledge, okay, I've got this imposter syndrome. Maybe they'll find me out. Fact. Your feelings are a fact. What am I going to do about it? And that's a lot of the mentoring I do for people with this in particular. And what I say to them is, first thing you've got to do is focus on what it needs, what you need to be successful. Okay, I feel I'm not good enough, but it doesn't matter. What do I need? to be successful. And you write these things down and you go from small successes, you know, just getting things done to start with. And small successes need to much lead to much bigger successes. The greatest the success, the less you feel you can't do it. Um, that's, that's one of the things I do. And the other thing I say to people is, look, you were chosen for this. There's got to be a reason why you were chosen. You've got competency. 
you know, a quarterback, Brady's retiring, a quarterback was chosen because you're competent. You wouldn't, if you weren't, you wouldn't be there. So however much you might think they're going to find you out, you have the skills. And that's what you've got to focus on. Focus on your strengths, focus on your achievements, and do a good job. That's the best way to overcome imposter syndrome. So taking the time to, to really consider where you're at, why you're feeling the way you're feeling, and why you're thinking the way you're thinking, I think is going to be really important. Um, recognizing that, of course, this is something everyone deals with. Everyone is is trying to wrestle and battle those inner demons and, and those insecurities and, the, and those vulnerabilities. Um, so there's nothing wrong with feeling that way. Um, but also then, it sounds like what you're saying is one of the things we can do, one of the proactive things is to uh, just practice some positive self-talk and, and some uh, positive thinking around where we're at and where we're going. Everything's about self-talk. Um, you could say, oh my God, people are going to find me out. Or you could say, hang on a minute, I've got a chance to succeed here. Um, mindset, negative mindset, positive mindset. I developed this theory about when you come across a problem. There was a very difficult intersection in the road where I, when I used to drive to work and I hated driving there. And one day I said, wait a minute, this is a puzzle. I like puzzles. As I got there, I said to myself, oh boy, puzzle, how am I going to get through this? And I, there were people teeming and cars and no traffic lights and you think you're going to kill somebody or you're going to be hit and I maneuvered my way through and I had the theory of oh boy and I started applying to everything oh boy work um, I hate cleaning up the dishes oh boy clean kitchen um, I said to my son we used to play cricket in the garden. I'd say, oh boy, cricket. He'd say, oh boy, cricket. So I said, oh boy, dinner time. Oh boy, dinner time. Oh boy, school. He said, oh boy, school, luckily. Now it's the same with this imposter syndrome thing. If you can say, oh boy, I've got a problem. How am I going to solve it? What am I going to do about it? Um, change your mindset. One young lad, 22, came to see me, studying for accountancy. He said, Honey, I hate tax. I said, Okay, Dean. Oh boy, tax. Oh boy, degree. Oh boy, career. He said he took his tax book. He said, oh boy, tax. It became a joke in their house. John is now an accountant. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Bluer than indigo leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. 
The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, that's a super interesting story and, and it's a good way of framing it. And, and so if we can practice the positive self-talk and, and honestly surround ourselves with good positive people uh, who can encourage us and be supportive when you know we're feeling those insecurities and vulnerabilities, then that can help us get past it. So as a leader, I, I first and foremost need to do that within myself. I need to do that inner work uh, and so that I'm in a place to to have you know a healthy positive um, experience in my life and, and in the workplace, uh, but as we talk now about how we can help our teams to do this as well, it starts with modeling, healthy modeling. But then, what can I do? What are some practical things I can do for my team, members of my team who may be really struggling with imposter syndrome? Well, this is if they're really struggling, this gets to the third level that I mentioned, and. Number one, what you can do is understand what they're feeling. Recognize their feelings. Um, yep, you feel this, I understand it. Um, then I would focus on their successes. You know, you've done this well in the past, continue doing that. Why are you feeling this? Let's, let's dig deeper into what you think you're not doing well. And why do you think that? Because from what I can see, you're doing a pretty good job. And maybe in that particular area, it wasn't so good. Maybe you should focus more on that. But I understand what you're feeling. Now, what are we going to do about it? How badly is it impacting your performance? Because everything, you want good performance, I'm your leader, I want good performance. The fact you even told me you've got imposter syndrome is significant. Because then we can move from there. Um, I think that you're much better than you think you are. Um, furthermore, you don't have to be perfect. Failure is actually the next step to success. James Dyson, the vacuum cleaner guy, produced 5,126 prototypes of his vacuum cleaner. So he failed. 5,000 times before he got to the, to the next one. Um, so I think your team with an empathetic but firm and you can bring the best out of them. I mean, I do a lot of mentoring. The object of mentoring is to stretch your mentees. How am I going to stretch you? This is good. You could do better. You could change your mindset. I mean, we can't let this affect your performance. <coughs> My guess is <coughs> that just the conversation will take away, to a large extent, the imposter syndrome. Just the fact that somebody can, can say, I've got this. I mean, what a relief. Instead of hiding behind, ducking and diving, stewing in there, stewing every day, I think it would change a lot. Yeah, I really like that. And I like um, the example about failure 
breeding and leading to success. It, it all depends on how we respond to it, how we react to it, right? And some people will fail and they'll get discouraged and they'll quit. And it's, a, it's more a matter of, can we just keep getting back up after we fall down, learning from the things that didn't work out? And if we iterate in that way, then failure is nothing more than an opportunity to learn and to grow, right? And so I really like, you know, as a leader, you get to set the tone for your team. You get to help influence and create the atmosphere and the, the culture of your team. And we should really strive for a psychologically safe culture where people know that they can be vulnerable. They can bring their whole authentic self to the workplace. They can bring their insecurities. They can bring their imposter syndrome. Uh, and they know if they know because they, they observe it, they see it from me as a leader, they see it from their colleagues, they, that when something doesn't work out, that they're not going to get fired for it. This, they're not going to get immediately called on the carpet for it or embarrassed in front of their colleagues, but rather it's going to be a learning opportunity. It's going to be a moment utilized to see, okay, what, why didn't that work? What can we change? What can we do better? And all of a sudden, you know, someone feeling imposter syndrome because they know that they're building the plane while they're flying it. And they feel like that's, you know, they're an imposter because they don't really know how to build a plane. Instead of feeling that way, they realize, oh, like actually building the plane while I'm flying it, that's, the whole point. Like that's, that's what everyone's doing. That's the whole point as we're trying to innovate and create new things is that we have to just um, constantly be trying new things, figuring out what's working, what's not working and in making adjustments as we go. And that, that's just the, the reality. And so I like, again, as you mentioned at the beginning of the episode today, how important it is, um, you know, to recognize our capabilities and also to, to, to acknowledge that, yeah, even some of the very most like tremendously successful people throughout the history of the world. And even today, um, have imposter syndrome, but they don't allow it to, to pull them down. And a, a huge number of people that are just kind of everyday average people, um, but still have success in life. They also have imposter syndrome, but they, they don't let it keep them down. And so let's, let's get past, uh, acknowledge it, name it, um, and, and recognize it and then, and then move forward. And if that means we need to, to practice self-talk, like literal out loud self-talk to get us in the right mindset, then let's do it. If that means we need to surround ourselves with more positive people, let's do it. If that means we need to turn off some of the negativity in our lives. So we have more positivity to, to encourage us to be more positive and more forgiving of ourselves. Let's do that. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all about just continual iterative growth and development. We don't need to be there now. We don't have to have arrived. No leader has arrived. It's a continual process. Uh, and we, we have this whole life to try to figure it out. And even then, we're not going to get it all figured out by the end of this life. So, so let's be more generous with ourselves and with those around us. And I think that can help to deal with a lot of this imposter syndrome. But the other thing I say to people when they say, I'm scared of this, I'm, if I do that, what about that person, that one, that one? I say, look, you're there. You have to do something. Because there's no such thing as nothing. You know, sitting in a chair on the beach is something. And I say to them, what have you got to lose? So they, they've got the so-called imposter syndrome. And I say, but you're in the job. Do the best you can. What have you got to lose? Because if you're going to crumble and throw your hands up and say, you know, okay, I'm giving this all up because I can't take it. Well, you're no better off than if you actually try something. And I think that's, that's a very important point, um, particularly for people who are, who've got real fear. Yeah. And, and, and something else I would say, perhaps as we're getting close to wrapping up is yeah. again, surround yourself with good people. Like, especially as, as a leader, once I'm in a, in a supervisory or leadership or management role, I'm no longer the expert on everything that's happening in my team. That's what everyone else's job is. I hire all the other people because they're experts in their area. And so it's very easy for me at that point to feel like an imposter because I don't have all the expertise that they all have. But that's, again, the whole point. My, my job as a leader is to help bring out the best in all of my people and to help them lean into their own potential. And, and so 
Uh, I don't need to feel inferior or an, as an imposter in that situation. I need to just get good people around me. I need to surround myself with the best people as, as good as possible and then rely on their expertise. And sometimes one of the telltale signs of people who have imposter syndrome in this really kind of in, embedded insecurity that may just be under the surface is they tend to have a lot of vibrato. They tend to have a lot of false confidence and they tend to try to micromanage people because they feel like they're going to get found out if they don't um, try to have their hand in everything. Think about that. Think about that. in you know, for anyone listening, think about that in your own life. We all have this, these experiences. Um, it's, it's not unique to you. Um, think about how you can diagnose it. Think about how you can make positive steps uh, to move forward. Well, Arnie, it has been a pleasure talking with you. I encourage listeners uh, to really check you out. Before we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance to let listeners know how they can connect with you, how they can find out more about your work, and then give us the last word on the topic for today. Um, thanks, John. Well, I've written this book called It's Not a Big Thing in Life. Um, which is one of my major strategies for coping. And I subtitled it Strategies for Coping, um, Considerations for My Adult Grandchildren, but it's actually for everybody. Um, I just, that was just the heading that was in my head. And it does what it says on the tin. It really is strategies for coping. There are 72 topics of various natures including work, money, um, relationships. Um, and that you can find out more about the book and about me on my website, which is arniewitkin.com. Uh, and the book's available on Amazon. Um, and in theory, I had imposter syndrome about this because there's Adam Grant, Dale Connors, Dale Carnegie, Anthony Robbins, Wayne Dyer, and there's only little old me. But in fact, it's, a, it's been very valuable for a lot of people. So I'm happy with that. Um, I think the last word on imposter syndrome is, if, is comes from filler on the roof where the tailor asks Tevya for his daughter's hand in marriage. And Tevya says, but you're only a poor tailor. And the tailor says, yes, but even a poor tailor is entitled to happiness. So my last word is, you might feel like an imposter. You probably aren't but you've got as much right to be there as anybody else and make the most of it. Yeah, well said, Arnie. It has just been a pleasure talking with you. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, check out the book, check out other um, work that you can do to help in them and their organizations. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life.
check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.